Well, hello, Hayden. Today we have a very special privilege. We get to uh, speak with Sister Trinity, uh, the Servadoras. Uh, she, uh, her baptismal name was Anna Hall. We're very pleased to have her with us today. Uh, hopefully, God willing, making final vows sometime soon. So as we've said before, it's a very blessed year for Hayden. It always is. But this year with the ordination of Father Luke Doyle, the ordination of Deacon Andrew Gaffney, and of course, um, uh, hopefully, God willing, the vows uh, for Sister Trinity, we are very grateful. So, Sister, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to, to chat. Absolutely. You're tuning in from Iceland, correct? Iceland. Very yes. good. Okay, so how long, have you been, how long have you been up there? I've been here in Iceland since April of 2019. Okay. So that's, that's when I finished my formation um, in February, and then I came here in April of 2019. Good. Well, it's an honor to get to finally meet you and, and talk to you. So um, what is, uh, in terms of your your community, what's kind of your your uh, daily life like right now? Uh, do you do active versus, I mean, you know, what's your active mm -hmm. life versus your, I guess, your prayer mm -hmm. life at this point with the community? Yeah, so we are an active community um, and we have a parish where we, we spend most of our time working. And as Servants of the Lord, we are part of a religious family, so we also have priests. And so in most of our missions, we we have the missions in in conjunction or in um, together with our priests. And so here in Iceland, as in with many of our missions around the world, we're with our priests. And so we're here at the, the parish of St. Joseph. And so every, every day we have... Um, time at the parish where we we work on various activities, um, preparing for the catechism classes. All of our classes are taught in Icelandic um, since that's the, the language of Iceland. Um, I'm still learning, but I, I help with one of the classes with our parish priest. I was gonna um, ask, I mean, cause that's, uh, how, how long has it taken you to acclimate to the language, the culture and, and many others? I'm still acclimating, but now that I've been here for two years, um, I can really, I can notice the difference because when I first arrived, it is a cultural shock and the language of, I of Iceland, of Icelandic is very, very distinct. Um, I've had experience learning languages. I was mm -hmm. learning Spanish, um, which is the, the language of our institute. And then also was in Italy for a year, but Icelandic is very, very different. Um, I really noticed the difference where Without a lot of effort, I can listen to the homilies, especially of the children's mass and understand um, everything that the priest says. And um, you know when you're starting to learn enough where when I speak with the children and <laughs> even though I can't say it perfectly, I reprimand them and they they give me a face because they know they, they know that I, <laughs> they understood what I told them to do that they should have been doing. And so those are moments where you realize that you're progressing a little bit I still have a lot to learn. Um, I, yeah. So those are the kinds of things that being a missionary, going to a new place, like you have to acclimate to and get used to. Um, but they're not impossible things to, to overcome. Um, if you keep in mind, like why, like why you're doing what you're doing and that you're doing it for God and that um, it's part of like the missionary adventure to, to experience those types of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that oh. makes the acclimation and understanding those things, those difficulties mm -hmm. a lot easier. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I can't imagine how, and as, as someone who did have to live in a different country for an extended period, uh, not as much as you will likely have to, but, uh, it's, it's a lot, but you're, it's, if it's for the right reason, it's, it's, it's worth mm -hmm. it. Um, so let's, let's just back up then. So let's, let's go. I guess kind of way back. I mean, I, uh, I'd love to hear kind of more your, your story, how, how your vocation, I'm. I'm sure we could, um, I'm sure there's a lot to, a lot to tell, but I, I'd yeah. love, love to hear it. Some of the students might be familiar with the, the tech program, Teens Encounter Christ in the diocese. And that was something that I, I got involved in when I was still at Hayden. And it was an invitation from the youth director. I didn't know really what the retreat was or what, yeah, what it entailed, but I went on the retreat and it really, really helped me a lot in the, the way of 
deepening my faith because the way I've described it before is it's kind of before I had this idea of like my relationship with God. I had the understanding that I wanted to grow in my relationship with God because I'd been going to a Catholic school since I was in kindergarten. But it was kind of that's where it stayed because I didn't I didn't know how to progress with it. I didn't know what I needed to do. And so the retreat really kind of opened up a, a door for me and it really reached my heart. And so that would be the first moment I would say that I, I started understanding what it meant to have a relationship with God. And kind of the, the retreat gave me kind of the tools you could say of like, okay, this is what prayer is. This is, this is what you do to talk to God. This is the importance of the mass, different things like that, that I never really thought about. And so I remember going back to Hayden with kind of a, my eyes opened in a way that they hadn't been before, realizing that, okay, this is what I need to be, like, this is the path I need to be on. This is what I need, need to be doing. And so my, that still didn't open up my discernment because um, I, I didn't really know what that was. I never really had contact with sisters, even though in our grade school, we had two sisters that were in the library. They didn't wear habits. So I didn't realize that they were sisters. I really, we called them sister, but I didn't know what that meant. And so through this retreat, I found out that because two of the sisters, there was two sisters who came to help on the retreat. And I found out that they were, they were planning a trip to Mexico. And I had started taking Spanish when I was at um, Mater Dei, when it was still called Holy Name when I was in eighth grade through a program that Hayden was offering. So I did it at night while I was there. And so I had an interest in Spanish. And so this, this idea of a trip to Mexico really sparked my interest. I didn't think about it because sisters were in charge of it, but just because I wanted to, to go out of the country and I wanted to see the world and I wanted to see how Spanish could be used in another, like in a real way, um, rather than just in the classroom. And so I went through the whole trip. I was there with the the sisters with a couple of their girls and it was my first contact with sisters and there was things that surprised me about um like what things that they said or they did and um it was just kind of a new experience and so then i remember coming back from the trip one of the girls asked me if i'd ever thought about being a sister and i said no i've never like honestly i never thought about it during the whole trip never thought about it um and so that was where the, I gave her a completely honest answer. Like I've never thought about being a sister, but then just two weeks later it would change drastically because the sisters invited me to come to a final profession of a sister. And I still didn't really know what that was either, but I went back to the um, Concordia, Kansas to where they had the profession. And so that was really the moment after the mass, the sister stood up to speak and give thanks for all the people that had helped her along the way. Um, to all the people that are present. And really in that moment, um, like thinking, reflecting internally as she was speaking, I felt like God said, what if that was you up there? What, what if that was you saying those words of gratitude if you were making your, that profession? And it was like a moment where <laughs> I was like, wait a second, I don't know. I don't know what I would feel about that. I had a moment of being scared, but then also excited. And so I was like, I've never thought this or had this feeling before. And so that was when I was 17. Um, and so that was really the first moment that everything kind of opened up for the first time or I had the inclination of, of what that idea even entailed, although I still didn't really understand much. And so to kind of jump forward because I could spend many, many hours just explaining what happened in the next couple of years, but I stayed in touch with these sisters while at the same time I continued um, going to school at Hayden and something that really helped me during that time I was finishing my junior year approaching my senior year um, I started from an invitation from Luke Doyle I started praying the rosary every day in the chapel um, and so it was something that was really yeah a moment of grace and a moment of just an encounter with God every day and so we would at the hour of lunch, we would disappear into the chapel and we'd pray the rosary during lunchtime and um, did that every day for the rest of that junior year and the whole senior year. And so it was something that was really impacting to me in a way that I could really open myself up every day um, just to have a little bit of time with God um, and just 
yeah, be there present in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Finishing Hayden, then I I went to Rockhurst University in Kansas City, Missouri, and continued um, understanding my faith at a deeper level. I started going to daily mass and became surrounded by a group of friends um, and housemates that were very Catholic and desired to grow in their faith. And so through that, I really started um, growing a lot and and started being able to to delve deeper into my faith as I continued to learn. And then another major aspect of my growth was through my involvement in FOCUS, Fellowship of Catholic University Students. As a, a freshman, one of the missionaries reached out to me and invited me to a picnic um, because FOCUS wasn't at our university, it was at the public university. And so they started inviting me, um, started mentoring me with the discipleship program. And I really um, started just falling more in love with my Catholic faith and understanding like what what it meant to be a Catholic, what um, like the treasures that are found in the Catholic church. And so through that time also, my desire, like the inkling of like, what's God wanting me to do kept um, pervading me. And so um, during the same time and throughout all these years, I'd always had in the back of my head, like what what is the life of a sister? Like, what does that mean? Like that thought never left me from the time I was 17 and now I was 22. And so it was not something that I'd really developed a lot at that point because I, I still hadn't understood what I was supposed to do. But through my contact with other friends and in, in college, I started getting to know of other orders. And so I, through that, I started going on weekends to visit different sisters and spend time with them, go on retreats. And so through that experience, I met a lot of different orders and a lot of um, friends to the were discerning and that was a huge thing for me because at one point you kind of start feeling alone like you're the only one thinking these thoughts and you're the only one that is wondering about these things and so you feel like you're kind of strange because no one else probably is thinking about this and so um it was a consolation that i started meeting other girls my age that were also discerning and so they became some of my best friends because they could relate to what i was feeling what i was talking about um and so we could grow together and so I continued studying, continued working a lot to pay for college. And so I didn't have a lot of free time or time to think, but those thoughts were, were always there um, in the back of my head about my vocation. And so as I approached graduation in college, um, I was really at the point where I knew that there was something big that God was calling me to do, but I didn't know if it was religious life or if it was something else. And so I started um talking with one of the missionaries a lot one of the focus missionaries um about my vocation because i found out she was also discerning and through that she told me that she was preparing to enter um the servants of the lord and so that was my first um contact i guess you could say distant contact with with our congregation was through her her words about our order and so i felt a little i don't know left like dropped there because she told me about them and then a month or two later she left to enter and so i just found out about these sisters she said you should do missions with them and then she left to enter and so i was in this point of confusion of like i'm getting ready to graduate just through another order in my path i already had enough orders that i was trying to navigate through and now she left and so it was a moment where i didn't know what i was supposed to do and so through a lot of discernment i've been really in, become involved in focus at this point and I felt at that moment that God hadn't made it clear um, what order I was supposed to enter, but he had made it clear that I was supposed to become a sister sometime in that year of my senior year. But because I didn't have the clarity of where, I knew it wasn't time yet. And so the clarity I had and the understanding that I had at that moment was that I was supposed to spread Jesus with the world and I, I thought it was as a missionary. Um, I remember clearly the moment arriving at the Servants of the Lord, we went to the chapel, they were in the middle of a popular mission, visiting houses and everything to invite the people back to the church. And I, I sat in, and knelt down in the chapel for the adoration with the other sisters. And this peace just came over me that like, this is the order I'm supposed to enter, like this is where I'm supposed to be. But then at the same moment when God gives you peace, at the same time, the enemy really likes to disturb that peace. And so at that same moment, 
I had all these doubts that came to my mind where it was like, no, but they don't need more sisters. They have enough. They're doing fine. You see all these vocations, like all of these different thoughts. And so, um, so I left the chapel and I mentioned to one of the the sisters um, who had known before she entered what like how much peace I felt, but how like these distractions had just come. And she was like, that, that's a silly fear because we always need more sisters. Like there's the church is always in need of vocations. And so that put my heart at rest in that. I asked to do an interview um, with the with the sisters, and the interview um, was actually it was done after I went on a trip with the whole order to to the World Youth Day in Brazil. So there's many other aspects of it, but um, all this to say that I ended up doing my interview, and then I had to wait another six months or so to finish my time with with focus. And in that time, I applied for a grant because I had many loans from the university. Um, and God worked through all of that. I received the grant um, of an organization called Mater Ecclesia, who is paying my loans so that I could be debt free to enter. And then upon finishing my year with focus, and then I entered in, in June of 2014. Okay. Wow. No, thank you for sharing all your, your story. <laughs> you I'm always amazed, you know, every, every vocation story is very unique as I'm sure you, you know, just from within your community coming from different mm -hmm. backgrounds, obviously places, cultures, you know, and, um, I feel like some things though, there, there, there are certain things I see in every single vocation story, like obstacles for sure. Even those who, have wanted to be a priest or a sister since they were four years old and could pronounce the word the, the word priest or father mm -hmm. sister um you know the, there's there's there are always obstacles and um yeah one thing i i guess i have a number of a number of questions but um uh -huh. so i mean one thing i one thing i kind of found with my own story is sometimes god does not uh, oftentimes really i have very few friends in the priest or religious life that say that can point to one moment where like, and that's when I knew that God was calling me to, you know, to like they, you know, they, they had a dream where the blessed mother appeared to that. That, that is a very rare, you know, uh -huh. it does occur, you know, but oftentimes it's, uh, it's, uh, it kind of seems like it was this case for you too. Like you knew at one point, like you were called to serve, maybe even not to live a normal life. Right. At, at that point, as we, as the yeah. world can see it. Um, yeah. so what would you say to that? I mean, does, does God, break i mean he breaks through our 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 um our stubbornness sometimes but he also he waits until we're patiently yeah. listening and you know, so. exactly and i see one moment of that very clearly where he's such a patient god but he also follows our own like the own desires of our heart like the way he led me into even starting to discern to discern and he probably would have done it at a different moment if if I wasn't receptive, but he took my love of Spanish, my desire that I wanted to learn Spanish and allowed me to go on a trip um, to learn about the language and wasn't pressuring me at all. Like during the whole trip, I never thought about being a sister. And so it was like, he really let me do what I was desiring to do for so long to have that experience. And then still waited those two weeks. And then when I came back, finally proposed even the idea of like, this is what could await you or this is what you could say yes to and so um in those moments he's very patient with us proposing all the time but never demanding and so it's very it's beautiful like my whole time of just learning was yeah a six-year journey and so it wasn't something that happened instantaneous for some of the sisters it's something they find they discern and within a year they're in the convent but mm -hmm. but god really has a, the perfect time for each each one of us Absolutely. No, amen to that. So, um, you know, one thing that, uh, I, you kind of talk about your, your experience with those, with the sisters that you met uh, through, through tech, I guess, through a number of cases. I mean, I, I kind of had this mentality in my head for, for priests and religious when I was a kid that I don't think is, uh, my fault, but it's very typical of our generation that, you know, well, they came out of a factory somewhere, you know, they, they don't, that they, um, and it wasn't until I, I, I met those that were had shared kind of their their past and how the Lord brought them there. That I was oh, they're really just like us in some way, you know. And yeah. not that we don't live a a calling that kind of removes us from just ourselves. Of course, the Lord imparts a character to us that's that's higher. But um, yeah, I mean, did is that is that kind of what it was like for you? That like, did that did that impression change for you over time? At first, I remember that there was 
this idea of of the mentality okay this is what sisters are this is what they do they spend their whole day praying they they don't have any fun different things like that and so when i started going on those retreats and meeting the different sisters um it was something that really opened my eyes um to how there's another there's a whole nother aspect to them They're, they live normal lives they they like to have fun um we go and eat ice cream like different things that you think that that are an opposite to to living the religious life you start realizing no like they're they're normal people um they do normal things but but they're just um they're called to a higher level they're called they're called to something more so certainly yeah and it is something more and in our our interview with uh with uh father doyle and deacon andrew yeah. one thing we talked about with them was just how I mean, there is with celibacy, there comes a not just the practical consequence that they're able to be more available to their people, but also there is a um, there's an evangelical part of it, like it's a witness, but it's also there is a um, God pours his his love and his grace into the hearts of those who embrace um, his calling in that way. And I think uh, I'm sure that's similar for for all of you, and I'll let I'll let you explain it. But um, I know with uh, for for religious, there's an even more um, you know, there, there is something uh, deep and very profound about what the Lord gives to you as you embrace the celibate state of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as many probably know, we we take the the three vows of the Evangelical Council of Poverty, Chastity, Obedience, and um, that's something where we don't make the promise forever the first time we make it. Um, the church is very wise in the way that we have the opportunity to to kind of grow in that decision or that commitment. And so when we first enter, um, we just receive the habit within this the first step. And so um, we that's the you start with a skirt when you first enter as a Pasha, and then after the six months or the, the year, then you receive the, the habit. And so that's our first moment. And then after one year, then we make the vows, but only make them for a year. And then um, as time goes on, we we make them again. Um, for another year, and then after that for three years, um, and then the final vow, saying that I will commit to do this forever. And so um, with those vows, um, each time you recommit to them, or every time that I've, I've professed them again, um, it's like you, you come to understand a deeper level of them. They continue to, um, to open or to bloom more and um, at first, and for anyone from the outside, like the vows can look like something that is constraining or something that inhibits your freedom. And that's a lot of times what people kind of put as an opposition to, to living the vows, um, that you're not able to be free with your body, you're not able to, to claim the riches that you would desire and you don't have um, freedom of your will. Um, and so it seems like that on the outside and without a, an actual, understanding of them or a love to to live them out they can be very constraining and they can seem to kind of cut cut you for your life and so but with the understanding of why we do them um makes all the difference like when you think about um the same in a marriage like when you you make the the commitments and the promises to a spouse um you make them so that you can love them better and so we make those vows to Christ so that we can love him more fully and more um, more intimately and with our whole heart. And so um, those vows really open us to, to be able to do that in a deeper way because we aren't attached to those things that, that so many people in the world are attached to. And so we're able to be free from um, the worries of, of trying to accumulate things um, with the vow of poverty and we're able to, to be free and willing to, to give of those things, um, without, um, desiring them. Um, and especially with the vow of obedience, um, it takes this, you have to look at it from a supernatural perspective, but, but it's allowing us to be available to the works of God and like what he he desires for us in everyday life, but then also in the the more 
concrete decisions or the more drastic decisions, for example, with, with coming to Iceland, I would have never chosen myself to, um, to send myself here. But, um, but with understanding that um, the church knows better, like the, the order knows the needs of the mission and the needs of the Catholic church, like you're open. There's wisdom, there's wisdom in obedience. Yeah. I mean, the Holy Spirit is the one who's truly at yeah. work in those. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, one uh, thing I remember learning is that, and of course, diocesan priests do not make a, a, a promise of poverty, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, but, uh, and not even all religious do for that matter. But, um, you know, one, one way I heard it explained is it's, it's actually, and I'll let you Mm -hmm. correct this if you choose to but some say in many ways the uh, the the council of poverty is the easiest of the three because it sacrifices the material you know whereas mm -hmm. um the uh council of chastity is the next most difficult because it's a sacrifice of the body and, and even of relationships the hardest is obedience because it's a sacrifice of the will which is the yeah. highest good of the human person exactly. right? and, and that's what that's the world sees as just so probably the most if we really were honest the most um the most not okay with how the world exactly. sees exactly because we're all looking for our freedom we're looking for the way that we can express our freedom to the full extent, fullest extent and so if anything comes to to fight with that it's an immediate battle and mm -hmm. so yeah it's I, I agree and it's they talk about it being like the mm, yeah, I don't know if you'd say the queen of all of the, the vows, but it's like the one that surpasses all of the other ones mm -hmm. in the way that it it goes to um, the will and like breaking your own will to be able to, to surrender yourself completely to God. And so it's a daily decision. Like it's not something that um, even after making final vows, you've done it and then you're you're good to go. Like it's something that every day when you wake up, um, you have to choose, I'm going to live these vows today. And so it's something that's not just done once for your lifetime, um, but it's a daily decision to um, to love God more. And, and there's moments where we're not going to live the vows well. And um, for that reason, we're always working toward perfection. Like we're, we haven't entered because we're saints, but because we're, we're working towards that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and there's, there's such a beauty to the the state of religious life, and uh, you know one thing that uh, I explained to the to one of my our, our sacraments classes uh, that they I guess they hadn't heard before was that um, you know that's why is why why don't why don't religious get a sacrament right or you know of course they get the sacraments you know as, mm -hmm. as we know but why is yeah. marriage tied to a sacrament why is holy orders tied to a sacrament but you know, uh, the religious life is not for, for monks, for, for sisters. Mm -hmm. And of course the answer is that, um, it's beginning something that is heavenly here on earth. And, it, and really it's acknowledging that it is a higher good. It, 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 it is above the sacraments because yeah. the, it, uh, the, the need for the earthly priesthood holy will not, will not, um, continue on in eternal life because our Lord is present there. We don't need the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Marriage, as good as it is in this life, it will always be a fact that that marriage occurred. Um, it's not eternal, right? And yeah. uh, this is, does that, does that give you like a, a daily joy that, I mean, um, it's just, it's just profoundly awesome, <laughs> I think. It is profound. And it's something that I think as long as we're here on this earth, like we, we talk about it and that's a real reality that we reflect on within the community and in different moments where we have um, formation and things like that. But it's something that it's hard to grasp with your mind, that idea. Um, but it is such a beautiful reality to think that like through our time here on earth, like we're only preparing, we're only foreshadowing something that will, will have its fulfillment in heaven. And so um, it is something that gives me a lot of hope and um, especially in those days that are more difficult than others, where you feel like there's just too many things that you're expected to do or that you haven't done well, but realizing that like, no, all of this is really, I'm working towards something that's, that's eternal. Like it's not going to end here at, in this moment, um, mm -hmm. in this catastrophe that ha just happened or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure, sure. No, and then yeah. your your identity as a beloved daughter of God that began a baptism and is enriched through this, of course, uh, continues on. And I imagine, I mean, I, I, that the active life that your community lives really is part of what drew you here and how the Lord called you through that. But I know with, with any community and with any state of life, I mean, the contemplative life is what gives uh, 
um, I'll borrow from a, <laughs> I will say a rival, a rival uh, institution, but the Carmelite, you know, the, the image that they have of like the mountain, the very top of the mountain okay. is the pure that where the, the snow comes, that's, that's God's grace. And then it, and mm -hmm. from that, it, that snow melts and it, it, uh, it nourishes the, the, the life that, that yeah. occurs down there. So I'm sure you're, can you talk maybe just a bit about your, um, kind of what, what does your community do prayer wise every day? Okay, so so we wake up every day at six o'clock and we have Lectio Divina for an hour. So that's reading the scripture. Um, so that's how we begin our day. And then after we, we have community adoration every day of the week for one hour um, and then followed by the, the reading of the Office of Readings and morning prayer. Um, and so those are kind of the strong um, start to our day um, to give us all of the the necessary sp spiritual power that we need for the day um and then we continue with um, our normal activities with breakfast with study work time um and then in different moments throughout the week um we have sometimes special adorations or we'll have a nocturnal adoration things like that um for special intentions um and then we always pray the rosary every day together um and those might be at different moments, could be on a trip or something, depending on our schedule. Um, but we always try to pray the Rosary in community. Um, and then we also pray evening prayer later in the day um, and night prayer. Um, and so those are the moments of our community prayer um, together. But then each sister has um, special like devotions or, or things that they might do throughout the day that are extra, um, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, different things like that. But um, we really try also in, in the daily work and the activities of the day to like make it a prayer also. And so even though we're not in the chapel, um, by offering, by like consecrating the work that you're doing, like even saying just a short prayer that like, God, I offer this hour of work to you, or I offer this study, like all of those things also can become a moment of prayer. And then we also try, um, or I try, to make different visits to the chapel during the day. We have the grace of having the Blessed Sacrament in our house. And so throughout the day, even if it's for 30 seconds, um, just trying to, to make a visit to Jesus throughout the day to like renew those desires, to renew that commitment, um, to ask for help or ask for just the strength um, or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so that really helps um, the communication like with God since, it's not like a human marriage where you can just go and like speak. You have to go to the chapel and speak to your spouse. And so mm -hmm. um, having those things in mind um, and those practices um, really help to, to kind of keep committed throughout the day or just keep um, with that, that mm -hmm. mentality or like the focus um, towards God. So you mentioned, uh, I mean, the way that Hayden prepared you kind of for obviously like some of the opportunities that you experienced there were part of what you, and then also your own initiative with, with the rosary. Mm -hmm. And of course, Father Luke talked about that, um, you know, in our interview, but uh, the, uh, you know, the importance of Catholic education, I think is, is one thing that's, it, I think it's very obvious to us in a way, but yeah. it's a, obviously it's a big investment as you and, and your family and all of us mm -hmm. know. So what would you say to those that, I mean, are just kind of looking and thinking about this, uh, um, you know, whether this investment is worth it? I, I think it's very, very important. And speaking from, this is something I didn't mention yet, but my parents are both converts. My mom grew up Lutheran and my dad grew up Protestant. And so through a journey on their own, uh, when I was about three, they, they entered the church. And so from that moment, they were 100% convinced of the true, the trueness of the Catholic faith. And so from the moment that we were um, getting ready for kindergarten, they were adamant that we had to go to a Catholic school because they knew um, the type of education that we could receive um, and the, the environment that we would be in um, compared to being at a public school. And so they, they really saw that value. And especially because both of my parents are hardworking, but they don't make a lot of money. And so they made many, many sacrifices to make it possible for us to go to Catholic school. Um, 
And the, the church helped a lot, our parish helped a lot, but then also my sister and I had to do the work programs in the summer at Hayden to be able to continue our education because um, there just wasn't enough funds to be able to do it. And we were only two, but it was a big investment for my parents, but they saw the investment in that. And so from the time I was in kindergarten until, until 12th grade, we went to a Catholic school and they never thought once about taking us out of the Catholic school to, to make easier on their budget but they always found what was the the options were that they could do um, things they could change and so that we could continue and so that was a really a big testament to me of like the importance of my education and the importance of of growing in my faith and um and doing well and um my dad was always so committed he would take us to the library every day after school to to work with us on our homework and so he really showed um the importance of the education and like the the value that should be placed on it by by his example of always um, being present with us while we are doing our homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the role of family is always more. I mean, anything a school can do is is pales in comparison to what uh, parents are capable of. You know, and yeah. where we have a lot of good families that, of course, uh, know that very very well. But um, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know your parents were were converts. I guess, but I think it's. It is amazing how, I mean, what, what would you say, I guess, to, I guess, students who are struggling in any way in the area of faith and, and, and family and anything like that? High school is a tough time to begin with, yeah. but with everything we've been through, you know, the past uh, uh, 14 months, whatever, since the pandemic uh -huh. began, um, you know, it's kind of amplified some of those things. What would you say to those that are, you know, would have a tough time with faith during these years? I would say that that it's okay to ask questions. Like there are a lot of questions that have, have come about from especially everything that's happened with COVID and just the events that happen daily in the world. Um, but I think the first thing is, is to not allow yourself to be surrounded by all of those questions and all of those doubts, especially about faith and to allow them to just continue to grow. It's very important that when there is something that we're unsure about, especially with the faith that we reach out to someone, um, a priest or, or a teacher that that knows the faith well to, to ask those questions. And it's not something like sometimes you feel like, oh, I should know the answer to that. Or I, I shouldn't ask that because that's a silly question about the faith. Like we should have learned that when we were in grade school and I still don't understand it. But it's something that like asking those questions um, are really what help your faith grow. And especially when there's questions that are, that come from the, the aspect or the ambit of doubt, like we have to um, be humble enough to ask those questions so that we can come to the understanding of maybe what, um, what God wants us to understand through it. And so it's never good to allow ourselves to stay in, in the doubt. It's something that we need to express um, especially when we're doubting about the faith so that um, we can come to a place of that, like that vulnerability that's always hard, but expressing it to someone that um, has authority in the faith, like a priest or a sister or, or a professor um, that can help us. Um, and we shouldn't ever um, be like mad at ourselves or, or think that it's a lack of ability on our part when we come to those things in our life that we don't understand because there's many things that happen that we don't understand and many of those things we won't ever come to a complete understanding of them because um as a saint i think as saint augustine says that if we ever come to the point of understanding who god is then we haven't really come to understand god because he is so far beyond our understanding that the things themselves surpass us because they're coming from God who is not able to be understand completely, mm -hmm. understood completely. And so um, we can take comfort in a way in that, that when we have those doubts or we have those confusions or we come to the moments that we want to just forget everything about faith because it's too complicated, um, we can take heart that um, faith is something that we have and that it's a gift, but it's not something that... Um, can be scientifically proven and everything. And so we, we give ourselves um, to God in faith and we give ourselves to the teachings of the church and faith 
Um, but at the same time, there is things that we can understand. And so um, I would say that the, one of the most important things is to express those doubts or those confusions or those things that, um, that are bothering us about the faith um, to someone so that it can't, um, so it can't continue to grow because when we keep them to ourselves, then it really, our minds and our thoughts can, can make it into something that it really isn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really. Well, good. Well, thank you. So anything else you want to say to, to all of our viewers? I would just say, especially for anyone, I don't know who's ever, but who's ever thought about a vocation or had that thought like come to them. Um, don't be scared by it, um, but really ask God, like, what, what do you want to, to show me through this? Like, allow him to be the one to reveal it to you, um, because if it is something that it truly is a vocation, like, he will continue placing in your path opportunities. He will continue um, speaking through the circumstances, um, and many of us don't have the opportunities, like, Abraham and Moses and all of them that God will speak directly to us. But if we look at the things that are happening in our life, God speaks very clearly through those, through conversations, through um, things that we read, through the homilies at mass. And so if we keep attentive to those types of things, um, God really does speak. Um, and the other thing that's really important is if it is something that you thought about, um, it's really important to surround yourself by friends and by in an environment that will help that that vocation or the possible vocation to grow and so you really need to it doesn't mean that you need to go on retreats with sisters every weekend or you need to go to the seminary things like that but just be very conscious of who you're surrounding yourself by um so that god continue can continue to to speak to you um and also that you can learn from the example of those around you especially in college for me, it was a huge witness being around those friends that I had chosen in college because they opened up to me in an aspect of the faith that I, I didn't know that I hadn't experienced before. And I really attribute to them um, the openness or the docility that I had to continue discerning because they helped me to see um, aspects of the faith that I hadn't seen and I wouldn't have seen just on my own. So surround yourself by good friends also. Awesome. Yeah, good advice. Very good. Uh, all of our kids take notes. So, well, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure you've got a number of commitments to the parish and your life today. So we really thank you. We'll be praying for you as a community. We look forward to God willing when you make those vows and continue to serve our church. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.